Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and the creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Like if you just said, do you want to hear podcasters talk about recording podcasts? I would say no, but then every time I listen to that, and it's interesting to me. Here's the, here's the difference with a show like this, though, is that a lot of musicians and teachers are interacting with this kind of software with some amount of regularity. So right. I think it's a little it's a little applicable and it has been a long time and usually the meta discussion is me explaining that my logic workflow is failing for some reason and not actually going into too much detail about what I do. So th- this deserves a little bit of discussion. You you're challenging my workflow in more ways than one today because this show is not only a way for me to, you know, it's a place where I record and sharpen those skills, but it's also I would consider it to be like a productivity at playground. This is one of the areas of my life where when I have guests who are productivity at nerds, I tend to try other tools. And I know we are both, maybe in a second, we should talk about how we're using the app craft to share notes for this recording with each other. We are other. using it like as minimally and lightly as possible, but yes, we are indeed using it. We are indeed using it. So let me, first, okay, so first things first. So recording, so right before we started recording, I was telling you that I record in Logic. It's not a broken system. Lots of people report that they lose data when they try to, or risk losing data when they try to record in Logic. It's admittedly a very, very heavy app for just recording my microphone. Sure. So you, right before we hit record, said I should use Audio Hijack, and I am irresponsible. So I said I would change that part of my workflow right a second before hitting record. And so here we are using Audio Hijack. The main issue was that I didn't know how to record my mic stereo and you told me which button to click so when this recording totally you know barfs and and ruins our entire session you know who to blame but i got that zoom backup recording it does show yes it's recording yeah. correctly okay and, it, and the nice thing is that that's recording a it's recording locally on your computer not to the zoom cloud and and b it's recording you and me separately which is nice Zoom is doing that too. No, that's what I mean. Zoom is that's what's nice. Oh right, about right, Zoom. right. You can you can record that's, to the Zoom cloud. I don't know if you do that ever, but you can. You can. I I don't. Yeah, not personally, but I do appreciate that it is probably the easiest way to record multiple channels of a conversation and get separate audio files. The thing that that I use in my teaching with recording to the Zoom cloud instead of locally is because I use, and we've talked about this before, because I use OBS to show my screen and stuff like that. And I don't want to see me while I'm talking. I want to see my students while I'm talking. And so my Zoom on my end is always in the gallery view. But I don't want to record gallery view for students to watch later if they miss class. I want to record just me. So if you record locally, you can only record the view that you are on. You can't record, like you can't use Zoom in gallery view and then record speaker view, for example. Interesting. Okay, so I've... Yeah, I do re- get so I do get video when I record these, but I've never checked the folder to pay attention to what I get. I assumed that I was getting a separate video feed for every person's camera. No, you only get one master video feed. That would be a bonkers amount okay. of data if it recorded separate video feeds for like a twenty-five person Zoom session or something. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, we are also using Craft. Oh, this is the before we get into that. This is the thing that I wanted to ask you before you. So I'm bouncing all over the place. Follow, yeah, there was there was one. This this relates to the follow up actually, the follow up section of our notes, which are in craft. So I did two solo episodes. The past two episodes of the show have been guestless, and I think it worked out super well for a number of reasons. One, it was a lot easier to plan thematically because I could say this is the topic that I'm doing and I'm sticking to it. Super easy one-shot recording with Descript, which is an app that you, I think you were an advocate for. You told me that it was worth checking out. It's an app that tran- you know, it transcribes my speech into a text document, lets me edit my voice like I'm editing a Word document. And that made it really easy to trim, edit, and produce. And then I was able to just keep these episodes a lot shorter, which I know some people really like a nice short breezy podcast for their commute to work so I, i've been pretty pleased with how the last two have turned out but i have forgotten to do album and app of the week in both of those recording sessions You're so fired. i'm fired so i apologize for that i'm gonna be hopefully making it up sometime in the future and this is i wanted to ask you this too is speaking of short and breezy episodes thus ends 
most meta discussion except for craft. I mean, should we say anything about crafts? Uh, if you want to, I think. I mean, it, it's a neat, neat, trendy kind of thing. It's the only thing that I have used that has any kind of collaboration that even approaches Google Docs. That's a, actually a really good point that I'm taking for granted. So I mean, yeah, we, uh, you know, there, there is. I think the the thing is with Google Docs is you know because I'm I'm embracing more of it in my life just because my school district is doing it and even my music team we're all apple users and you know we've traditionally shared we have a shared notebook in apple notes where we do some collaboration but even my team was like we're doing a meeting recently and you know one of the members of the team said can i just do a google doc instead of the apple note and i'm like okay i i don't want that but i you know i think i think for him he was like you know we're already living in this space so much we might as well just embrace it you know a word processor is in a web browser is a little heavy for plain text for me it's like takes too many steps to find but i also appreciate that we're there and i you know i think it's interesting to that i'm using it more you know google i I don't want to be using google but they just have such a firm lead and i think the reason they have such a firm lead and are so popular is because they are still one of the only platforms that syncs fast and reliably and craft seems to i mean we're both playing around in this craft doc now at the same time and it seems to be going pretty reasonably well one thing that I think is really cool about Craft as opposed to Google Docs is that Google Docs is still like kind of trying to be Microsoft Word and, and kind of trying to imitate a paper document model. And they obscure that a little bit in the defaults, but there's still a page break and there's still margins. And one cool thing about Craft of many cool things is that it doesn't pretend to be that. Like it's only there to be a store of knowledge and information which can take a lot of different forms and it has a really useful way of linking between craft notes. And I just, you have a a, a numbered list here. And just as a test, I added an extra element on the numbered list at the top. And, you know, if I drag that earlier, it renumbers everything automatically. Like that's Mm. stuff that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get out of Google docs because it's made for making a a paper document, or at least it's made with the like, you know, prior conceptions of paper documents even if nobody who made it ever actually intended you to print it yeah i'll be the first person to use an app just because it's a nice experience and this is definitely a nice experience i resisted it at first because i had only tried it on the iphone and i think now that i'm looking at the mac version it's a lot clearer to me how everything works because you know one of the things i like about a good mac app is some of the productivity stuff i use imitates the iwork suite conventions like having there there's sort of like a sidebar on the right where most of the formatting tools live and you can hide it rather than having a a bunch of buttons at the top that are sort of like crafty and like just make it the whole program look ugly and distracting so i like this little sidebar here it definitely is stylized different than something like a pages or a keynote but i appreciate you know i've got all my Heading, subtitle, formatting. What's this thing here that says group it as a page or as a card? That I do not understand. I was trying to play around with that because you and I were having some struggles getting this document set up the other day, and I thought that might have something to do with it. Whoa, I just clicked one of those two and something happened. Oh, I just made a new page for this step. So you added, yeah. So, so okay. Interesting. Okay. And there's this arrow on the right of every one of these text elements. So, like, if you wanted to turn this this topic suggestion into its own thing. Oh, wow. You just turned that thing into a card or a page or what? This is a card. Oh, wow. Go back up a level and take a look at what it looks like. It looks very classy. Yeah. Well, that's the name of the text font style that I chose before finalizing the card. I don't get what this is, though. Like, is it's it like just, a sub doc. How is it different than a page, though? It's linked to this one. I, I assume this is like listed maybe hierarchically if we go up to the document list. Yeah, this is a big trend in text-based productivity software. Now, I'm noticing with a lot of notes and writing apps, especially for the Mac, that there's a lot of these sort of contextual features that are popular right now, like with creating links in one note that links out right. directly to another note, which is definitely cool there's kind of i find that with apps i love creating connections between them because they're otherwise non-existent you know like like for example i go to the doctor and i type some notes in a note and then i want to create a task like set up follow-up appointment and i'd love to you know create a link associated with that task that will take me straight into the note for more information and there seems to be two ways that software is doing this which sort of highlight the fundamental 
honestly, like the fundamental differences between the software I use, which is, is it like web based or is it like really more of a native experience? And I know at least on the Mac and on iOS, you've got apps, some apps that can like provide a URL to get to that content as a deep link, which works system wide. And then you've got other stuff. Like I know we're going to talk later about Evernote, <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, Evernote is sort of like this more web centric way of, Hey, we're going to generate a link to something that's like, this is actually a URL to something, you know, you could, you could type this into a web browser and, and just get to it straight from, from the web. And these are, so, I don't know, these are just two sort of different but complementary ways of linking things together. Yeah, I think they're really cool. And I think that is, I think, a better way to go about putting things together than trying to find an app. I know some people would maybe think they want, or maybe they really do, I shouldn't speak for them, want an app that does both the tasks and the notes and the calendar and uh, everything all together in one. And and to me, I would rather like let an amazing calendar app like Fantastic Cal take care of my calendar and then take care of my, you know, quote unquote knowledge management in something like Craft or or what I actually use is Bear for my notes and be able to link around those things. And I, I to be honest, don't use as much of that linking between these different applications using URL schemes and deep links like you're saying, as as maybe I could or should. But I I like having the, that separation of concerns. Can I just, can we just go straight to Dev and Think Evernote? Yeah, let's do it. David's task app quest. Okay, you're, we're already there. Okay, yeah. I mean, so let's let's kind of get into this, into the weeds here a little bit. I mean, you I know you have started uh, a couple months ago, you started on a quest to find a new task app. And then, of course, we're talking about notes and craft isn't really an app that I would call a note app, but it's definitely a house for text and images and other kinds of data. I guess, you know, the dream is to just sort of have whatever you want to be the subject of your focus in front of you at whatever time it should be in front of you. Right. Whether that's based on time, location, state of mind, attitude. And, you know, I, I try to string my apps together in a meaningful way that'll always get me to this place where I'm not fighting against my computer and I... You know, one of the pieces to this puzzle is: would you would you call Devin Think? I, I Devin Think I wouldn't call a note app, but I would, and I, I'm not even sure I would call Evernote a note app. Although it, it it can, I mean, it is a note app that you can put a lot more than just text and images in. But I would at the same time consider myself to have used them both similarly over the years, which is like half as sort of a dumping bucket of miscellaneous email, web archives, text files, media, and then sort of conversely as a research tool where I sort of gather specific data, organize it into folders or projects, and then just have that exist in a purely referential way. And, you know, I was using Evernote. I've been using it since 2008. A couple of years back, I moved to DevonThink, which is a Mac and an iOS only thing. I have recently moved back to Evernote. You are currently trying DevonThink. Yeah. What, what problem is that solving for you? What are you, how are you feeling about it? It is much more of a research bucket for me than it is anything else. And research very broadly speaking, in the the most kind of literal direct sense, it is the app that I have gone to to replace an app that I had been using for, gosh, probably five or seven years now called Margin Note, which has gone through several mm. major iterations. And I still really like Margin Note, but it has messed up some of my, my very carefully curated metadata more times than I care to think about. And the last time it did so, I... I, I, I I would say that I rage quit it, but I just like I literally have it open right now as I look in my doc because I have enough documents that are still there that I haven't moved over and redone all of that organization yet because, you know, I've got to still teach class and write music and do all those other responsibilities. And so at the moment, I am, as I find new things, putting them into DevonThink instead of Margin Note. And then eventually I'll go through the process of moving all of my documents from margin note to dev and think and so what i have in margin note that i plan to move to dev and think are things like textbooks research material from journal articles or web articles that i want to be able to have access to either because they're relevant to my teaching i teach music theory the kind of first year music theory courses, theory one and two. I am also often involved in teaching upper division theory stuff. Every other year I teach a graduate seminar in music analysis, which often involves 
you know, reading a bunch of journal articles from Music Theory Spectrum or Music Theory Online or whatever, and I need to have not only my own collection of those articles to pull from, but also my own annotations of those articles and how they might connect to one another topically or whatever. And so that's kind of the things that I had in, in margin note, along with a lot of things that I scanned myself. So I've, I've been on a, a many years quest to I don't think it's reasonable, nor do I really want to eliminate all paper books from my life. But having, you know, been in academia for as long as I have been, I know that I have to move house a lot. And so I very quickly realized that I did not want to carry 17 boxes of books every time I leave a new place. And so, you know, two or three is, is a lot. And so that's kind of what I what I try to stick with. So I, I've gone through a process of... of you know, taking a book to my local copy shop and having them saw off the binding and feeding it through a document scanner and having that OCR so I can search through it on the text, which has been very valuable and saved me a bunch of time over the years. And so anyway, that's a big chunk of what I have in margin note now that I am slowly migrating over to Devon Think for. In margin note, there are two different systems of organization for PDF files, and well, any files, but they're mostly dealing with PDF files. You can use folders, just like the folders you would have in Finder or Windows Explorer or whatever, and you can use a system that they call, ta- no, they call them categories, but the icon for them is literally a tag, and they behave as tags. So anyway, they are they. The nice thing about tags, and I think when I put together my my Devon Think system. I'll be able to use everything that I learned about the tagging system in margin note and make this work better for me is that I can put one article in multiple different categories. So for example, I'm very interested. I I don't do a lot of traditional conventional scholarship where I write articles that have a bunch of footnotes and whatnot and publish them in, in papers because my field is music composition. My research is my creative activities. And so I still, though, am very interested in reading about music theory pedagogy because that's what I end up spending much of my time doing. And there's been a lot of really interesting and really valuable research and scholarship in that field over the last few years. And so I collect articles that are valuable to me in that regard. And so I will want to keep those in one place. At at the same time, maybe one of these years, I'll end up teaching a graduate seminar in music theory pedagogy. And so I need to be able to have a collection of articles that is overlapping. Like these are things that are related to my own teaching. These are things that are related to a class that I might want to teach and assign to students for reading. And so those are not entirely overlapping, but they overlap quite a bit. And so that's really hard to deal with in a folder structure. And so I really like tags for that kind of thing. So anyway, that's the sort of system that I hope to build up in DevonThink. And one thing that I really am looking forward to in DevonThink that Margin Note doesn't do very well is handling web pages and 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 saving and marking up web pages for offline stuff because there are increasingly more and more really, really good open education resources and open scholarship online. And so if I find a really good article in music theory online, I might want to save it. And they provide a PDF, but in some ways it's not as good as the the web version of it, or it's just different than the web version of it. And so I want to have both of them and be able to mark them up in a way that makes sense to those forms. So anyway, I've been talking for a long time, but that's kind of how I am thinking about Devon Think. I'm really curious to hear how you, because I know you are a at least an occasional dabbler in, in Devon Think, and, and I'm very interested to know what drove you back to Evernote after all these years. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been, I'm not really an occasional user. I've been using it for the past three or so years, and I've finally just hit a breaking point with some, I mean, I guess, I guess what you're, what you're saying is, is all exactly, you know, why Devin think is, is perfect for the kinds of things that, the kinds of problems that you want to solve. I mean, it is a great research tool. Evernote was just, you know, Evernote was kind of stagnating and they are a subscription cost and their app is not necessarily pretty. They were making, you know, about three or four years ago, they were like really just making some bad decisions as a company and I was getting really annoyed uh, and I knew that Devon Think was getting a redesign and Devon, Devon Think, by the way, has a very generous trial period of like something close to 200 hours of use on the Mac version. I mean, it is actually, I love it. I wish more apps would try that model i mean it is truly enough time well it is truly enough time to learn if the app works for you but of course as i'm going to explain in a second i was having like major major sinking 
challenges with it. So I guess it's not long enough to figure out that part of the equation. But yeah, I mean, m- more or less, it was, you know, I know Margin Note is like a little more PDF focused, but DevonThink can pretty much take any data you throw at it. It can take files, it can take websites, it can save a website as a link to a website or as an archive. A couple of other ways you can save a website too, but I love that you can just archive the way a website looks verbatim and then automatically all the text becomes searchable. You can create groups that combine emails. You can throw email into it. You can actually, there's an importer that just takes all of your email and just brings it all in, makes that text searchable. So so again, kind of in the same way that we were talking about linking notes from one application to tasks and another and all that kind of contextual stuff. I felt like DevonThink and, and, you know, to some extent Evernote were great buckets to sort of like work on projects well for, for doing two things so research-based stuff like what you're saying like where i want to find st- ideas later from various places but then also to be able to work on projects where i'm mixing media so for example i can't if i'm working if i'm taking my band to assessment i can save all of the related documents in a folder in my finder but i can't i mean i can put an email in there but what i would much rather do is create a group in dev and think that has all of the files that I'm working on. It has websites, URLs, like maybe a better example since we don't use we don't use the web a ton when we plan for an assessment. Like, but if we're taking our band on the Hershey Park field trip, like we'll have, you know, the, the coordinators of that trip will send us a link to a page where we have to fill out some data. I can drag that as a web archive. I can clip it right into Dev and Think. I can save relevant emails into the same group in Dev and Think. I can take, I can even like reference a folder on the hard drive of my computer so i can say hey don't actually take this folder of documents and duplicate them into dev and think but just make basically like a reference to them so that i can text search them all and see them alongside other stuff i've dragged into dev and think but when i double click it you're actually taking me to a file that's in the finder of my mac that kind of stuff so you can really you know grab everything and it has an amazing apple notes importer an amazing evernote importer i got all of my apple notes evernote stuff in there i have a a really cool script that i stole from someone in the dev and think forums that'll actually take pinboard and like save all of your pinboard pins pinboard for those who don't know is like kind of like a a web tool that clips websites and then makes them text searchable but it, it unlike dev and think it they're all Pinboard runs in a, in the web basically, unless you have a. It's basically really app. fancy bookmarks in your browser. Like it's 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 like it's, the bookmarks yeah. that you save to your browser, but has a lot more organization and, and annotation features built in. But I had, had been using that for a while, right. and so I was able to like just get all my pinboard stuff into Dev and Think, and it was just really good. I liked the power features. It's got an automatic keyboard shortcut to link to create a task in OmniFocus, which is my to do app, and then like it'll link you straight to a thing. That's in Dev and Think. And that thing can be a folder of stuff. It can be a link to a web archive. I just, it was more or less just serving that sort of like purpose of multimedia project organization, but also a little bit of the research stuff you're talking about. And then also just this like little bit of like, I'm just browsing the web and I just don't want to forget something I'm looking at. I just want to, I want to find it later. And it can be something like a really funny TikTok or it can be a journal article. And I just, it's sort of like a digital brain. And it was working great for me, except for that across three different syncing platforms, three different attempts, and multiple different computers and versions of DevonThink, I could not get the syncing to be reliable or fast. It is (laughs) really important. Yeah. So I am am looking forward to never reaching that point with my DevonThink database. So it's interesting. I I, the stuff that you're describing about like your your personal projects and, and and kind of personal knowledge stuff, I keep that stuff in bear so and and one thing that i so bear is super lightweight it's super fast it's very searchable it has a tagging system that i tried i've tried to use at various stages throughout my my bear curation but mostly i just search for stuff but i keep a bunch of the sorts of things that you're talking about in there so like i have i have a a bear note about my car that has like the the VIN number and every time I put an oil change, it put a line in for the oil change. Every service that that I put a line in this this bear note. Every so that that stuff's all in a note and it has photos. So like I, I in addition to actually typing out the VIN, I have a photo that I snapped of the little VIN tag in the in the driver's door. And then other stuff can go in there too. So I drag in PDF files every time I every time I travel. Remember traveling, I I will you know save my 
hotel reservation and my rental car reservation and my flight reservation stuff all into a bare note and then also list the you know confirmation number in text as, as well and that all syncs super fast to my phone that's also a subscription but it's like i don't know 15 bucks a year or 20 bucks a year or something like that. it's very 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 inexpensive and and it has you know most of the the modern ios and mac features that can do split screen and slide over and stuff on and and drag and drop and and all those kinds of things on the ipad so it's it's my chosen tool for the sorts of things that you're talking about in in evernote and for whatever reason the way my brain works i like to keep my 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 personal nonsense separate from the the research that i'm collecting from outside yeah that's totally fair and i'm doing more of that maybe with regards to like project based to do's and email but the thing the thing is that a lot of times it's it's an out of sight out of mind kind of thing like i just need the tool that's going to clip it the fastest sure like here's let me here's a case in point for why this kind of tool works for me and then why evernote is a temporarily better solution than Devin think I'm not going to call it a good one, but like I, it's the kind of thing where I'm like, okay, I'm on a, I'm on a web article and I, gosh, I don't even want to make up that like this could, this could be something related to work or not, but I'm somewhere and I'm looking at some text on the web. I want to clip it. Okay. What do I do? I clip it to Evernote. Great. Now, like a day later, an hour later, a minute later, I'm on a different device and I am drafting a blog post. And maybe I want to remember a quote from that article. Open up Evernote on that device. There it is. I, you know, I wait a little bit for it to sync, but because Evernote is running you know, off servers and because everything is just syncing through the power of the web, I, I, I wait a couple of seconds, but I always get the thing that I clipped. I don't even have to open the app on the device I clipped it from for it to reliably go into the, you know, it goes like straight to the web. So it's just a real low barrier to entry to grab a bunch of stuff. And maybe one day I'll find that Evernote is a tool for like just super low priority clippings of random stuff. Cause that's the thing too, is it just, it searches so easily. That's the, the number one feature of one of these apps is I want to be able to add stuff to it easily, not do a ton of tagging and organizing some, but then I want to be able to group stuff into projects if necessary, but most importantly, just search in the text search box and find it. And Evernote so far, it's like all of a sudden I'm not fiddling with my system at all. I'm just clipping the stuff I want to remember and then finding it when I want to. And it's Evernote is not pretty. Evernote has not added really any great features since 2008 that I can think of. If anything, it's, it's a worse experience than then because it was a little bit more simple and had less stuff that I didn't want it to do. Like there's this feature where you can like chat with people about the documents that you share. Oh, and because Evernote is a web thing, I can just like give someone a URL to an Evernote note and then they can just look at it. It's almost like, you know, I, I used to do this before. Now I just, when I do conference presentations, I just make a blog post with URLs because right. to be quite honest, I'm vain and selfish and I just want to drive up more traffic to the stuff I'm doing. But Ever I used to use Evernote because Evernote used to be one of the things I would talk about in a lot of my presentations. And I would say, hey, if you download it, you can not only see this, these session notes, on the web, but you can actually clip it into your Evernote notebook. And if I edit it or add stuff, it'll just go straight to your device. So, so it's cool. It's got, it's got some features for sure. I am a lot of that stuff you're talking about with bear. If it's text based, I will leave it in drafts, mm. which is still my number one place for text. It's just where I, it's where everything starts. So if I am going to type a text message or a task or a to do, or even a note, I start typing it in drafts and then I send it. It's got, you know, actionable. You can like tap buttons that'll send it places. You know this. I'm just making sure, sure. the audience knows this. In fact, I will link the developer of drafts. Greg Pierce. Greg Pierce has been on this show and came on years ago. And we had a great conversation about drafts. It's super cool. But it's, it used to be an app where I would only start typing stuff. And then I would always send, like if something was just a note, which to me means text, but I wanted to remember it later, I would, I would send it to Evernote. But then what I've been learning recently is like, why even like just archive it and then search drafts. It's already in there. You know, why not just I'm, leave it there? I, it makes me, it pleases me to hear that you are using so many different tools because I feel like sometimes I get into this conversation with other people who are not Robbie Burns uh, and tell them, well, I'm using Dev and think for this, but for stuff like this, I'm using bear and for other things I'm using tot which is a, a completely different kind of text-based 
note syncing thing, which is designed to be much more ephemeral. And then for still other text based things that even some of those include media, I have things in Ulysses, which is another simple text based writing app. And in my head, those are all completely sim- like I, I, I have never thought to myself, here is a piece of text and I don't know where to put it right now. Like I always know, like this is the sort of thing that I'm going to write in Tot and this is the sort of thing that I'm going to write in Bear and this is the thing that I'm going to write in Ulysses. And and I feel like in, in explaining that to other people, oftentimes their first reaction is why don't, first of all, why don't you just use Google Docs? But then also why, why do you have all those different things? And that's, I think, one of the reasons why at the moment while I think craft is super cool and super interesting and I want to continue playing around with it for quite some time, I'm not sure that there is a place for it in, in my like regular day-to-day professional life outside of just like playing with a cool technological toy. The kind of thing we're doing now in craft is what I would typically do in a note-taking app, something with very light formatting options, bullet point lists, boldened headings, you know, things like this. In fact, I normally share with my guests, an Apple note, but I've more recently learned that, you know, a lot of people really just like Google docs. So I, you know, and it's also, it doesn't matter if my guest has an iPhone or not, I can just, you know, share a Google doc and it's fine. So the syncing reliability of craft definitely feels suited for a Google doc. The note taking thing feels suited towards an Apple note. Yeah. I don't see where this, this fits in for, for notes, particularly text. I do not prefer to have this many tools. I would rather, have it all be you know in evernote or something well, i don't i try to i don't see that's the thing is i don't really want to be using evernote it is just the best solution for the situation i described right, right. is this so, boring is this it made this is a little bit of meta conversation is this boring talking about text editors for 30 minutes <laughs> i don't know it probably i'll probably cut a little bit of it i mean i think the main the, the main thing i wanted to address is like You know, I think that there are definitely people out there. Actually, I should mention, so I should have said this right at the beginning, is I wrote a blog post for the National Association for Music Education, Mm. too, actually, that I've uh, written in the past month and a half, two months. And the most recent one has a little section on clipping tools, basically like what you know web browser extensions and apps that just like will take a thing you're looking at and really quickly grab it and save it somewhere without you having to really do much and so i'm so i'm definitely this this topic has been on my mind i know a lot of teachers will want to know you know what are the tools that do this and certainly devon think is extremely heavy like i can't think of a music teacher i've ever met where i would recommend devon think to them but i would certainly recommend evernote you know it's got a free tier it's pretty straightforward i, I don't that's the thing about devon think we should have said this up, up front devon think is costly compared to most of the other applications that you are are used to purchasing for your for your work and especially i think the it's hard to explain its value in a way that doesn't make it sound like a fancy version of google docs plus the finder or something like that here's the thing though is that i also i i say you know i wouldn't recommend this to a music teacher i mean i'm you know that's most people i know but i there are also music teachers who are getting their master's degree who are you know getting their admin certification like there are absolutely reasons to say hey i want to level up the tools i'm using i'm ready to graduate behind beyond a google doc or i am using something like evernote but i need something that can handle a little bit more lifting and you know devon think is in fact i would even argue that my syncing issue is not really relevant because most people i know only do this kind of work when they're sitting in front of a computer yeah, but this research stuff is super interesting. So I don't know. Who knows? Maybe I'll cut some of this out. But, 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 yeah. I, well, so Go I was going to ask you, there are a couple of other things that I think are, are worth mentioning in this context. You and I have been corresponding over, over text messages this last week about your exploration of, of good notes, which we've obviously spent a bunch of time on this show talking about you and me before. I'm curious where, cause like by, by time, like minutes of the day, that is by far the thing that is open on my iPad the most. And I'm curious what you're doing with good notes there. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah. So I Which, said, by the I way, like we using... should say is another thing we could have used other than other than craft since that also syncs now. Yeah, and and handwritten handwritten. So I, I don't find so the way I describe good notes is because the because the notes the three the notes apps that I'm using right now are Evernote, Good Notes, and Draft. And I do use some other things for like very very specific 
solutions to very, very specific problems. But when I describe good notes to someone, I try to be very, very upfront with them that I don't think it's a holistic note-taking solution. I think it is very, very good, if not the best, for handwritten notes. And as we talked about on our, we did a whole episode pretty much on good notes and PDF editors for the iPad and like annotating with Apple Pencil. Like we, uh, I think good notes is great at three things. One, having a great feeling response responsiveness to the apple pencil so just like writing handwritten notes feels good feels real good it's very good as a digital whiteboard so putting something on a screen for students to see and then drawing shapes and highlighting things and blah 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 blah. blah. and then i also think and this is not really that different than the two things i just said but i think it's great for working with pdfs when the sole thing you want to do with the pdf is draw on it so if i just want to sign all the form fields of a pdf with my own handwriting or for what I do with GoodNotes is I have a paper template that is a seating chart of my band. And then every week I create a new page of that document that has a fresh copy of my seating chart and I annotate notes about kids on it. Like this kid did a great job on their B flat scale on Tuesday. This kid was like arguing with me about this thing, gotta call home, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I, 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 I totally agree with the way you're describing good notes. I just think it was kind of an interesting thing because it, it, you know, it has notes in the name and it's essentially organized around this idea of notebooks, which, you know, is, is a thing that is, a, is a, an analogy that a lot of note apps use. The other thing that, that I have not figured out a good solution to is do you read on eBooks at all? Or do you read mostly paper books? I'm glad you brought this full circle. Cause you were talking about, how you're using DevonThink to grab your textbooks and do and like mix in stuff you read on the web and put them all together contextually, which makes so much sense to me. But I have for so long struggled with this because am I, I hope I'm going in the same direction of this as you are. I, I was going to ask you when you were to saying that if you also keep copies of the same textbooks in like the Kindle app or the iBooks app or something that has a cleaner swipe and read experience without a bunch of tools all over so the place. So I do not keep things with like PDFs in iBooks. I, d- I do use the, the Apple Books app on my iPad, but usually the thing that I put in there are manuals for devices. So like when I get a new mm-hmm. camera or whatever, I save a PDF copy of the manual in books. I have no idea why I put it there and not other places, but that's just what I do. I could probably now start putting them. The, it's the app has a picture of a book on it. It's like, I'm going to find my books. I right? tap the book. Like it makes sense to the me. The thing that I, that I am struggling with and that I was going toward and, and you did get that one is Kindle books. So I have been lately reading. In fact, the, the book, most recent book I finished is, is this new book that a bunch of trendy education people have been reading Susan Bloom's Ungrading and Mm -hmm. just came out in December 2020. It was really interesting. I highlighted stuff in in the Kindle app as I was reading it. I occasionally made a note or two, but all that stuff is now like, you know, handcuffed to the Amazon Kindle ecosystem. And I don't know exactly how to incorporate those things into something else. What I can do is go to Amazon, their like cloud web-based reader thing and export all of my highlights to a separate document and then make a really very excruciatingly ugly text document of all of my highlights, which I did at one point to share with someone else while I was reading this. And in fact, I dumped them into a craft note and made the craft note public so that I could send this person a link and it would be there on a web page. And it actually looks like, you know, there's nothing ugly about it as far as craft is concerned, but there's the text itself is kind of ugly. So anyway, that's the only thing that I can think of right now, but it does require me to manually, like when I'm done working with a book, do that export step. And if I were to ever go back and make a different note in the book later, then it wouldn't obviously sink back into my whatever note-taking system I have. I don't know. Maybe this is stuff that eventually should live in bare, but I mostly wanted to play with the, the craft, like web publishing part. But I, yeah, I haven't, I, that's one thing that I have yet to figure out is what to do with books that I have purchased from the Kindle store and read on my Kindle device. I actually have a, a Kindle Paperwhite that's great. If you ever, if you're interested in an ebook reader, the Kindle Paperwhite goes on sale for like eighty bucks or sometimes even less. Sometimes 
it's really good it's really really good my kindle paperweight is from 2011 and it still feels like a new device and people tell me who are kindle fanatics that the new the one oasis the, like the high pre- and premium one yeah they tell me that that premium one is like real nice and i don't know what i'm missing and i tell them like i read glacially and my like i think that my kindle paperweight has not even gotten any i don't feel like i've gotten its enough value out of it even in 10 years to justify buying a new kindle the paperweight that i have is i think a newer generation than the one that you're describing because i bought it re like in recently like two years ago after an update to it that made it waterproof so i could like take it to a beach or sit by a pool or in a bathtub or something like that and read and not feel angsty about my ipad or something being that near a large body of water so like I, I took it on a trip to to a beach a couple of years ago and it was very nice to have so for that reason alone i i i, I would consider a newer kindle paperwhite but i like you do not read nearly enough to justify the expense of the oasis though i can agree it so- looks like a very beautiful device it sure does. Yeah, it sure does. I will I will say that it's a two two ideas about integrating Kindle research with some of the other research tools we're talking about. So there is one and, and in my NAFME section in that blog that I wrote for them about clipping, I also mentioned another app called Instapaper, which I don't actually know if I've ever talked about on this show, but it is for basically clipping articles from the web to an app where it will f- take out all the ads and like format it so that's pretty much just videos text and images and it'll make it look kind of like a newspaper like it's got a real elegant sort of typography to it and it just it cleans things up a bit it's a nice reading experience so there is an app i haven't really gone deep in it but it's called readwise and it will take all of your instapaper highlights and kindle highlights and round them up for you Hmm. i'm i'm kind of interested in having a place that takes the ideas I thought were significant from websites and the ideas that were significant in books and then rounding them up. It has a little bit more, less of a focus on finding the stuff and more on like reminding you of it. Like it's primary tab that you're open to when you open the app is like this day, two or three years ago, you highlighted this in this book. And I'm just like, I don't care about that. I just save all my stuff. I'll know what I want when I'm ready to look for it. So I'm not hundred percent sure that this is an app for me, but it is something worth downloading and checking out. The other thing too is like, I, I want to live in a world where Kindle, cause you know, there are, I'm noticing that there are more and more textbooks on the Kindle store and also like, you know, music method books each and every passing day. And I'm starting to, to buy more of that stuff and put it in my Kindle library. But there's just, you know, my dream of Kindle being a really good citizen of the Mac is never going to come true. Like I would love to be able to search the spotlight and like find quotes that I highlighted in Kindle app books and it's just it's never going to happen so here's honestly what i would do and this sounds hacky but again if it's reliable maybe hacky is fine i would take a screenshot of an important quote and then clip it to evernote (laughs) or devon think both of which will automatically search the text of images add some tags add some keywords boom done is it pretty Eh, no but just an idea. Yeah, I, I, I'll have to play around with it. I think I have a few too many highlights for that to be a thing that I want to spend time doing. But I do, I do like the, I do like the idea of getting it somewhere, in, and maybe Devin think is the place for it eventually. Please keep me updated on the sinking. Should we do some tech tips of the week? Sure. Sorry, that was that was a long, <laughs> long tangent. Totally, but it's all good. So I'm going to do the Apple Pencil screenshot gesture. Okay. I'm sure you're familiar with this one. Do you use this often? I don't use it very often, but I do know of it. I like it. So as we were talking about earlier, I have been using GoodNotes as a handwritten note app. In fact, I've been using it quite a bit lately. I'm just just really enjoying it. So the Apple Pencil has been in my hand a lot more recently than ever it has before. And I really like this gesture where you take the tip of the pencil, you swipe it up from the lower left corner of an iPad screen, and it automatically takes a screenshot and then brings you into annotation mode where you can annotate whatever was on your screen and then send it to someone or save it to the camera roll. Some apps have support for basically grabbing the whole entire document, not just what was on the screen. So like if you're in Safari or uh, a great 
productivity app that does this is called MindNode, which is for making outlines and mind maps. If you take a screenshot of a MindNode document and not all of the data was on the screen, it'll actually allow you to take either the capture of what was on screen or you can go into a click a button that says document and then it'll actually like the mind known app will like fit everything in your document into the screenshot regardless of how what the size and dimensions are and then you can annotate that and then save it so it's just a real cool gesture it's just a swipe up in the lower left corner and then you're scribbling on top of whatever was on your ipad screen super handy i use the 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 long web page thing in, in safari all the time it's great you just want to highlight couple lines of text out of a document or circle something in red. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So my tech tip this week is, and I know you've talked about accessibility features on the show before, but there's a really great accessibility feature on the Mac. If you're ever showing something on a screen to other people, you may have found that the the thing that you're trying to show, like a button in an application, if you're trying to show students how to use like Soundtrap or something like that, and you don't want to just make everything on your screen super giant all the time, but you want to zoom into one particular menu or one set of buttons, you just want to make that one little thing bigger. There is a feature of the Mac that is designed for accessibility for people who have visual impairments that you can just make part of the, you can just zoom in on one part of the screen. So this is called accessibility zoom. If you go to your system preferences on the Mac, there is a whole category there for accessibility and there is a section for zoom and you can assign a scroll gesture. And so basically the, the way I have mine set up is that if I hold down control and option while I use the, the scroll gesture on my trackpad or the scroll gesture on a mouse or a track wheel on a mouse if you've got a scroll wheel while holding down control and option it will zoom in to whatever my mouse cursor is hovering over and that's really really useful for like i said software demonstrations or if you're just showing a document and you want to make something really obvious to people in the back of the room you can zoom in on it that i will give you one small caveat there depending on what software you're using to make this work if you're doing like a screen share over zoom or teams or something like that different screen sharing things will treat zooming in differently than others. So sometimes it will only zoom in for you, but the screen capture will kind of still be capturing the whole giant thing. So depends on, on what you're using to capture the screen there. So you may, if you're using this for a demonstration over Zoom, you may want to test it with somebody else first or, or some other software. You may want to test it with somebody else first. But for in-classroom stuff where you've got your screen mirrored on um, a projector or something like that for other people to see super super useful little tip and i and i think robbie i'm gonna save that other accessibility tip for something else nice yeah that is the number one thing i get asked at a, like because i use the zoom thing in conferences totally. a lot where i've when i've almost just stopped making keynote presentations and i almost just like start with my computer plugged right in and just say like this is my computer i will show you how i use it now and then i just do it the whole the whole thing live and i use that a lot in every without fail every single time there will be one person who will say how are you zooming mm -hmm. in to where the cursor is how are you doing that yeah it's it's a great feature and it's in my experience it works with both google meet and zoom without any fiddling around it has tended to to be yeah. fine it's, it gets a little funky uh, if you've got multiple monitors set up yeah but you know yeah. you just need to do it and then get right back to where you want to be exactly right yeah because if you're like if i'll keep my google meet window with all my students little squares on the opposite monitor and that one will zoom in too and i'm like no 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 no. i want to be able to see the chat but yeah, yeah still sure still a pretty good let's see which order do i want it all right so yeah you know i one of the recent times you've been on we talked about using open broadcasting software and and if streaming has been the subject of a couple of presentations i've done a lot of things that you've blogged about and written about and it's just it's been a part of our teaching this totally. year and when i got into my workplace to do hybrid teaching at the beginning of March, I realized that I was lost without my stream deck, which is how I change the scenes in open broadcasting software, which is basically like what showing my students are, you know, are they seeing my face full screen? Are they seeing my computer background? Are they seeing my computer background with a little me in the lower left corner? Like what I'm broadcasting to them can be more easily triggered by the stream deck, which is this little device with light up square buttons that I, you know, I just, tap it doesn't matter if the action i've programmed it is you know related to an app that's in the foreground or the background i just tap the button and it 
changes what the students see. So it's been really, really handy. I get to school and I realize, you know what? I have depended so much on having these buttons always available to me for this kind of work. So I would like to buy another Stream Deck. Well, I really wanted to be like you and get the giant Stream Deck with more buttons than what my one at home has. And it turns out it is out of stock everywhere. Really? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. The big one is very Even your popular. local stores? They carry it at like Target and Best Buy and stuff. Like I got mine at Best Buy because I was impatient. Yeah, I think I should probably just go there. I haven't done that yet. But I, but then I was giving a presentation on using open broadcasting software to improve hybrid and virtual teaching. And someone asked about the app. And I was like, you know what? I've never tried the app. So I downloaded it. And sure enough, for you can get an iPhone or an iPad app that Take, you know, I mean, if you're plugged, if it's connected over the same Wi-Fi network, it will show you all of the same buttons you have programmed on your physical stream deck, only they will just appear graphically on the screen of your iPhone or your iPad in the same exact alignment and layout. So what I've done is about in the position of where my stream deck is on my homework desk. Well, I've put a little wireless phone charger in about that same position. And then what I do is I just open the stream deck app and I put it on that charger, it's constantly charging, and then I have access to all of my quick buttons for changing my scenes and running my favorite reference MP3s and, and all of that stuff. And what's cool is it's really, this is a great one for teachers because if you are interested in using something that can change your video output really quickly and you don't wanna spend 120 or something dollars on a device that you don't think you're gonna use after COVID is over and done with, the Stream Deck app is like two or three bucks a month and for, for that, I think it's definitely, I'm getting the value out of it that I want. Does the Stream Deck mobile app work with SlideOver on the iPad? I haven't even launched the app on my iPad, but I will find Interesting, because that, that might be a thing that would, that would sell me on it. Because I find with my Stream Deck, the thing that I have run into, and this is going to sound bonkers to any normal person listening to this, is that I run out of buttons on the Stream Deck XL because I use it to play back musical examples in class. And some days there's only like two or three musical examples and we're doing a deep dive on a, on a small set of things. But every once in a while, the class is, you know, looking at a bunch of different examples that are each two or three measures long. And so I reserve four to five spaces on my Stream Deck XL for musical examples. And usually that's enough, but it's not always. And it would be great if I could like on my iPad slide over, play it and then get it back out of the way. So that's that's something that I'd be interested in. I'm curious if it has more, yeah, can fit like more buttons than any of the physical stream but stream decks have on like an iPad Pro size. That would be very because my iPad Pro is way bigger than any stream deck I've ever seen. Yeah, I, th I think it's probably bigger than all of them. Not that it's a competition. So <laughs> my app of the week, I'm going to squeeze in two that are both related to using your iPhone or your iPad as a camera. One of them is going to be very useful for working with your iPhone's camera remotely. So I don't know about most of, I think for most people, this is probably true. The highest quality camera that, that you usually use is the one that's attached to your smartphone. So I have an iPhone 12 Pro Max, which is ridiculous and absurd in lots of different ways. But one of the ways it's ridiculous and absurd is that it has a very, very nice camera. I have a small format, like nice camera, a micro four thirds Sony camera, but I don't get it out very often because it's kind of a pain in the butt. And instead I use my iPhone a lot. So there is an app called Camo from Reincubate. And it is a, an application that lets you use your iPhone camera as a webcam. So you can use it directly in Zoom or Teams or whatever, or you can run it into OBS and have that captured into Zoom or Teams or whatever. And so I am using that right now so I can you know show occasionally an overhead shot of something that I'm working on to someone and I have my my camera perched above and then I can just use my stream deck and switch from my normal webcam that points at my face to my overhead shot and then the thing that I've been doing recently I was showing Robbie before we started recording is as students come into my classroom in the morning my class is at 8 30 in the morning and it's you know first year music theory, it's not something that a lot of students want to be doing at 8.30 in the morning at, at the age of 18 or 19, and I totally get that. So what I do is I plug my phone in, point it off to the side. There's a big floor area next to where I teach from in my home studio, and I play with the cat. 
And my cat is very strange in that she likes to play fetch. And so I will sit there and play fetch with my cat um, while people are coming in and we're listening to music on Zoom. So I can I can access that really quickly. And it looks great. Like it's super smooth. It zooms and or doesn't zoom. It focuses really fast, much faster than my other USB webcams focus and does really great color. And it can focus at short distances better than my my webcam can so it's it does a lot of things actually better than my normal webcam and so anyway that's that's all in ring compute camo it is not free but it's also i think reasonably priced it's an annual subscription i think it is normally forty dollars a year you can get an education discount the way to get that is to send them an email so if you go to their website there'll at least for me, there was a big banner across the top that said, educators, click here for a discount. And that just opens up your email client and you send them an email and say, hey, I'm a teacher, please let me have your thing. And they send you a nice email back. It, a real person looks at it, so you might have to wait a day or two. So don't expect to be able to like do this and use it in 10 minutes. But they're very fast on the turnaround. It took them, you know, maybe... I did it over the weekend, so it took a little longer. It took maybe 24 hours. But anyway, I, I think that's a great application. And then when you get back to working with people in person and you want to shoot video, I highly recommend an application called Filmic Pro, which is another iPhone application. It records video, and it will give you a lot more control over the video that you're recording. You can choose what lenses you're using. So if you have a recent iPhone, you probably have more than one camera lens on the back and the front of your camera, and you can choose among those. And the coolest thing for me is that you can remotely control the Filmic Pro app from another app called Filmic Remote, and that I run that on my iPad. So when I am recording my ensemble performance, I am standing in front of the group conducting usually and I'm conducting from my iPad and right before we start I can start the recording on my phone by tapping a thing on my iPad that then starts the the iPhone recording which is you know 30 feet away from me behind me so that's a really cool thing that you can do and that's I think the most practical thing there are a lot of other features that I could you know sing the praises of on Filmic Pro you can choose the audio inputs as well and do all kinds of cool stuff with with how things are recorded but just the idea that there is a very useful remote application that you can have installed on the same iPad that you may be using to read a score while you're while you're making a, a concert recording I think is is super handy that's the one that was featured in an iPhone keynote once, right? The there was one. It's the same company where there's like two. There's like a bass player and a saxophone player, and they're standing on either side of a, an iPhone 11 or something like that, and they're both they're recording both cameras at once or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Is that not so? Filmic they, Pro. The way they pitched it, I think they, I think the Filmic people may have changed their mind about how that was going to work beforehand. But they had originally pitched that as a part of Filmic, and now that's actually a separate app from the same company. And I don't remember. It's called, like, Duo or something like that. But it's, it's, hmm. it's a different app, same company, and it is very cool. And I think that app might actually even be free. I believe it is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've tried that one before. But Filmic Pro is great. Yeah. And, and now that I'm awesome. looking at this, Robbie, I'm thinking that that Filmic Pro recommendation goes way better with my other tip of the week than it does with the one that I mentioned this time. So everyone will just have to listen to next episode where I publish the second half of this conversation, which we were, yeah, are we, <laughs> we expect that conversation to start with a little bit of a review of the four score app for Mac and their new syncing feature. Yes. So stay tuned. <laughs> but before that, we've got album of the week and I would like to go first. Do it. With an album called Yolo EP Volume 1 by, I think it's pronounced Owain, Owan, maybe. I, this is like, whenever I play this, I think it's just like one guy who does all the sequencing and plays all the instruments. But whenever I play this artist for someone, they immediately say, yes, this is the music that you listen to. <laughs> They're like, I am not surprised to know that this is something you like because what it is is it's like progressive progressive like guitar centric led kind of like rock but with like a lot of sequencing like lots of drum programming lots of arpeggi arpeggiated synths and things and just like a metric modulation like too often but 
not too often that it isn't like really good to listen to. Like it, it just kind of catches you off your feet and you, I'm sure that I, I would like, I'm not hearing the center of the beat exactly in the same place that he is at every single instance, but it's like, it's just like, I don't know. I, there probably would be people who would say, I just need my music to stay in four a little longer than this guy is ever willing to stay in any one time signature. But it's just like a real ride, a real trip. And he keeps it real tasty because all of the melodic content is like these like real delicious kind of like almost like, you know, hair metal kind of <laughs> it's like this like kind of like really, really high register, like electric guitar bending and noodling and i don't know it's just real it's real satisfying music and and definitely different he's got so this this is like a six track little short bit i guess he's he's planning on doing more of them since it's called volume one but uh, this has two tracks on it that actually have lyrics and like a singer on it so like i and and i think one of the two if not both are like way more like metrically grounded and just like heavily syncopated but there's always like you can count to four (laughs) throughout the whole track and it strikes a real good balance for this guy because I'm like, wow, I hope he does more of this because it's a real it's a real good match. But yeah, the music is just real cerebral and all over the place. But it's also like techni- it's like this kind of like gent style of guitar playing with lots of drum like metal drumming kinds of things happening, but also lots of hip hop and other electronic musical style influence. And I think I'm I'm like ninety percent sure that it's is all there him singing with occasion just on the new thing i don't think i don't remember any of his previous records having any vocals Hmm. uh, before this one i I might be wrong but there's like he's got like two or three other albums before this all of which are good but this one is i don't know if it's just been long since i he's done anything and i'm excited i don't know but i've listened i've listened to it like a lot this week and last week it's cool it's real cool i would be really curious to hear what you think about all right i'll check it out my album of the week is not an album at all, but rather a YouTube channel by a band called Scary Pockets. You should check out the Scary Pockets YouTube channel. They do funk covers of all kinds of things. So some of the things that they do are like, you know, classic rock tunes. Some of the covers that they do are just classic songs generally. So you'll find Michael Jackson. You'll find, I don't know, there's Prince tunes on there. Some of them are like kind of bubblegum pop things. Like one of the things that I really enjoy that has bubbled up in my recommendations for this channel recently is Hanson's Mbop. So it's very interesting. And they do these funk covers. The band features kind of a rotating cast of characters, but the two that it it centers around are, and I should learn their names and I I just don't know them. One of them is a a guitarist. The other one is a keyboard player. And the, the keyboard player is, what's his name? Jack. Jack Patreon of Pomplamoose. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Jack. So it's it's the 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 keyboard player is is the guy from Pomplamoose and the guitar player, and they do these recording sessions. They used to, and you can like see them. They're video recording in a recording studio, and they've been doing interesting things over the last year to do their recordings in a way that is like socially distant. They've been doing some that are outdoors they've been doing some that are you know where they're each in a separate iso booth they've been doing some in like giant gymnasium kinds of spaces they've been doing some wearing masks and and anyway they're they're very creative clever kind of funky tunes they have different singers that they work with and they have a kind of a rotating cast of of singers that you'll find in some of these some of my my favorites are are mario jose is is a great one he does a great i will survive cover which you know is dangerous territory but he does it very very well yep. and another one is a kenton chen who does some some really really fantastic covers there's a great Katy perry firework cover that that he sings but they're they're really good sometimes they have horns sometimes they have backup singers sometimes they have extra percussionists sometimes they have extra guitarists and the only thing that's constant is the the keyboard player and the and the one guitar player. But they're very good and they're very fun to watch. I used we talked about descending fifths progressions a couple of weeks ago in my music theory class and I showed them Mario Jose's I Will Survive cover. So that was that was it's really fun. It's really good stuff. And I always will if I see a new Scary Pockets video, I will drop everything and watch a Scary Pocket. Would you consider them to be even though they're sort they're sort of like they have sort of a novel premise, like would you consider them to be part of the Wolfpack extended universe? Oh, totally. In fact, there's they, they play around with like any good YouTube channel, play around with titles to try to get people to click things. And the 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 Hansen cover that I mentioned earlier, I believe currently has the title of If Wolfpack wrote Mbop by Hansen or something like that. And in fact, yeah, of course. speaking of, course of YouTube gold, I think that is one of the ones where YouTuber Adam Neely is playing bass. 
Ah, yes. Off the record, your favorite bass player and music theorist. Back on the record. <laughs> I did not did not say that. I want to be so honest about... I was thinking about a couple of artists that I consider to be part of this same internet, YouTube-centered world and getting your opinions on them. Like For some reason, I was thinking about both Snarky Puppy and Jacob Collier and Adam Neely all right before we got on this call. And should, should I, you I want me to, to rank them to you? like off the cuff or you want me to just like... Because Snarky Puppy is definitely I just, at the top of that hierarchy. I Well, definitely. And I don't have... I don't also I don't think dislike. of them as like a YouTube sensation the way I think of No no but I feel like they've because some of their earlier records were all recorded in front of a live studio audience I feel like that adds to the the charm of watching them Yeah for sure I there's I think when there's rose, I I'm, I I get I get greater charming feels from watching Wolfpack shows on YouTube watching yes, Wolfpack for d- for sure. the, the the video like I can't believe they put the whole thing on YouTube for free the the Madison Square Garden concert yeah I know they're definitely milking that you know I mean because that's that's this, the YouTube thing has always been what they do I mean Jacob Collier has also always been a I mean Jacob Collier is the one of these people I just mentioned who is I'm the most critical of is that I fair? think that's fair I I also think to be to be super fair to all of them I feel like the last like year ish of Adam Neely he has really st- stepped up his level of like critical thinking about the things that he's talking about. And I think it's probably because he's gotten a lot of tweets from people with higher degrees in, in music theory, because he had, he used to get a lot more stuff wrong and those videos are still up there, but he would often oversimplify to the point of not being useful anymore. And oversimplification, as you know, is an important teaching technique, but he would get, he would take it a little yes. too far sometimes and uh, he doesn't do that. I don't think nearly as much as he used to. And, and, and and I will give him credit. I at first kind of poo pooed his lengthy look into music theory's white racial frame with Phil Ewell as just like a YouTube regurgitation of Phil Ewell's original paper, but he actually does do some extra commentary on it that I think is valuable. And I think it was great that he got Phil involved through a huge portion of that and it's it's such an important topic i also think that i was a little bit too dismissive at first of the value he brings to it by bringing so much extra attention and reach to the issue by putting it on an adam neely video than phil ewell is going to get from the 2019 society of music theory plenary session Uh, um, or an article in music theory online so i think i i i I was originally a little bit dismissive of that and in in retrospect that was that was wrong i mean and and he did actually a very very good job with that particular video and has been doing much more interesting things not starting with that video but starting from around that time that i think he had been doing in the previous few years yeah, that's my favorite. Say. I would. I would. Sorry, go ahead. My. I was gonna say my favorite music theory nerdy YouTube channel is Twelve Tone. I like that. I like that one. Yeah, I like that. There's a. They have a Discord that I'm a member of, but I don't really ever. Oh, open it, I but. should. I'm a. I'm a Patreoner of 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 theirs, and I. I am not in the Discord. Maybe I'm not at the. I'm. I, I may not. I may not be at the oh, level. I, I'm not. A, no, it's free. Oh, really? The Discord is free. There might be. Cha- there might be channels that are paid, but I am in the Discord, and I'm not a supporter. All right. Well, I will. Uh, I will check out the the twelve tone Discord. I have voted on what he should analyze in in videos, and I and I did vote for the Dolly Parton one that he did last month. That's a that's a good one. Yeah, I I should I should I was gonna cut all of this out, but now I feel like if anyone doesn't know any of these channels, they're definitely his all... his stuff that he's been doing over the last like eight to twelve months on, or it's been more like two years now on loop theory which is a relatively recent kind of thread of scholarship on how full chord and four measure loops work in in contemporary post-millennial pop music is actually fascinating and it's he's not doing he actually this is one place where he has done kind of original theoretical work but even if he didn't it would still be very interesting because a lot of people don't don't think about it in the terms that make sense for this kind of music it does not behave the way that tonal music behaves yeah. Sorry, that's a tangent. We could talk about that sometime, too. We should. Well, should we talk about it next week? Sure. We could talk about it next week. That sounds good to me. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice. 
and you can subscribe to the podcast in the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. You only get an email if I actually post that week. Please rate and review this show in the Apple Podcasts app if you use it, or if you don't. It absolutely helps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about the show. You can learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Pinterest, all of the places at Robbie Burns. See you next time. <laughs>